morning and welcome to Synchronizing Clocks, simultaneous audio playback capture on multiple audio interfaces, devices and or networks in practice. Who am I? I'm Fabian Ren Giles. I'm an independent contractor. I've been working in the professional audio industry, software audio industry for at least 20 years. I was the former the lead developer of Juice. And quite recently I've been working with some of these really nice companies one of them which is Sing, and the work that I'm presenting in this talk is all work that I did for Sing. If you don't know about Sing, definitely go to their homepage. They make this beautiful speaker, both beautiful in sound and the way it looks. And as you see in this photo here, if you have two speakers in one room, there's no physical link between them. So a key challenge is uh, getting them to play synchronously. Now this wasn't work that I did alone. Um, there was a team behind this. Uh, Significant contributions were from David Bryant and Jay Coggan, sitting just here. Uh, so let's get started. So what's the problem? If I have two audio interfaces connected to a laptop, won't they just play in sync? Or put in another way, won't the number of elapsed samples of both of these audio interfaces be the same for any given moment in time? Well, it's not going to be because there's something like a quartz crystal inside of each of these audio interfaces and they won't be cut exactly the same way. So although the nominal sample rate is 48 kilohertz, for example, the actual sample rate might be slightly different. This is exaggerated, of course. And so the audio between the, both of the audio interfaces will slowly drift apart over time. And even worse, that drift is not static, that drift is dynamic. It, it varies with temperature, age, electrostatic environment, etc., etc. So the goal of this talk is, can we find an algorithm to somehow align these two lines again? And we will never do that perfectly. There will always be some kind of error remaining. And a good question to ask is, well, how much time sync error is tolerable? And as all good questions in life, it depends, right? If we have uh, several speakers distributed throughout the world, uh, then maybe you know, up to a second is, is okay. If uh, they're in different rooms but in the same home, maybe 100 milliseconds is okay. In the sing case, where they're in a single room, uh, research has shown that even lay people can hear around 40 microseconds of audio desynchronization. So that, that's tiny, that's just two samples in 48K. And to be safe, the sync cell alpha has a synchronization accuracy that's better than five microseconds. We were only talking about the playback side here, right? Uh, the recording side is even more stringent because you don't know what's going to happen with the signal afterwards. It might be time stretched, it might be pitched, you might be aligning transients. Uh, so they are really um, the largest tolerable error is something around one microsecond, for example. And for those of you interested in latency in this room who want the lowest possible latency, well, it turns out that your latency can never be better than your time sync error. So if you're interested in latency, you should also be interested in time sync errors. Now, before I start with the main section of the talk, I need to introduce you to a word I'm going to be using throughout this talk, which is clock domains. And one example of a clock domain is, is the wall clock domain. That's just the time that a clock on the wall would show you. And that's a useful conceptually as a stand-in for what the listener may pe perceive as time going by. <coughs> Another important clock domain is the ticks clock domain of your laptop. So your laptop doesn't count in real time directly. It counts in something called ticks, which is roughly proportional, well, it's exactly proportional to the quartz crystal inside your laptop. And because it's so low level, there are some very, very efficient calls to get the number of ticks that have passed since boot. Uh, typically, on some OSs, it's just a single assembly instruction. On Mac, you would call Mac absolute time to get that value. And now the number of samples that have played or have been captured since the start of playback or capture, well, that's a clock in its own right. It, it's measuring the progression of time. And, and just to note, that might not be an integer value, right? Because you might be in between playing two samples. So now we have all of these clocks and they're all running at different rates and they all have different offsets. And now suppose I'm going to fire a gun. And now we have the same point in time, that point in time when I fired the gun, but each clock domain is showing a different value. 
That same point in time is being represented by different values and different clock domains. And one of the key questions in this talk is, how can I convert between these representations, all pointing to the same point in time, but having different, different representations? Okay, so that, now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about the basic audio synchronization algorithm. And for this, I'm going to assume a few things. First of all, I'm assuming that we're synchronizing a capture device with a playback device. And I'm assuming that we're doing all of the work in the capture device's audio callback. So first, we're going to read some samples from the capture device, right? And I'm assuming a buffer size of 1,024 here. And then I'm going to update a variable which counts the number of samples that have been captured. And as mentioned before, this variable is a really good stand-in as a clock. It's, it's measuring how time progresses on the capture device's uh, audio interface. So it's a clock in the clock domain of the capture device. Or more specifically, after that line has executed, it's representing a point in time when the, um, when the uh, the capture of the current buffer ended, right? It's representing a point in time when the capture of that current buffer that I'm processing ended. And it's doing that in the capture device's clock domain. And now I want to look at the exact same point in time. I'm going to introduce a new variable which points to the exact same point in time, the point in time when the current buffer capture ended, but I'm going to do this in the playback device's clock domain. Or put in another way, it's in units of the playback device's samples. And to get that number, I'm just going to introduce a magic function called convert clock, which somehow converts between clock domains, between the capture device's clock domain and the playback device's clock domain. And now the algorithm is, is really rather simple. I just calculate the number of samples I need to write to hit that endpoint by subtracting the number of samples I've already written in previous rounds. Then I somehow expand and compress those 1,024 captured samples I got. I expand and compress to the number of samples I need. Then I write out those samples to the playback device, and I increment the num samples written counter. That's the basic audio synchronization algorithm. And now there's one tiny nitpick in there, and that's if I do it exactly as shown on this screen here, you would instantly get an underrun, because as I said, the playback position end points to the point in time where the capture buffer, when, when in time, the buffer that we're processing, when it ended, when the capture of that ended. And that's going to be in the past by the time I write samples, right? Because we need some time to do processing. So I'm just going to add some kind of target latency here so to account for that. And depending on how fast your computer is, this target latency can be lower or, or higher. So really, the main takeaway of my talk will be that Expressing your synchronization algorithm in, in terms of this general high-level algorithm really neatly divides the audio synchronization problem into sub-problems by introducing these magic functions like read and write samples. Right? Read and write samples abstracts away how we talk to the hardware and abstracts away some of the buffering we need to do in the latency requirements. The expand and compress samples abstracts away the ASRC and some considerations we need to take when we're using an ASRC to do audio playback synchronization. The convert clock abstracts away how we convert between clock domains. And there, I'm going to further subdivide the problem into the algorithm that does the conversion of the clocks and something I call timestamp pairs, which I'll introduce later. And you might look at this audio synchronization algorithm and say, hey, I've written one of these algorithms before, and it doesn't look like that at all. And uh, I would say, yes, it actually does. If you would write it in the most general form, it would look like that. But you already inline some of these magic functions. And if you inline some of these magic functions and play around with it and move stuff around, that basic algorithm will change its form to something completely different. And I'll show an example of that later in the talk. And because I like this uh, subdividing of the problem into these four subsections, that's the way I also divided this talk into these four subsections. So let me talk about this read samples and write samples first. Now, typically, you don't really have a read samples and write samples style API in your operating system that lets you talk uh, to your audio devices. What you typically have is a callback style API where, for example, in the, in the playback case, the operating system gives you an audio callback where you need to fill a buffer with playback samples. And so we need to bridge these two style of APIs with a ring buffer, for example, or, or sometimes called a FIFO. Uh, 
And in the playback case, uh, this write samples magic function pushes samples into the ring buffer, and every time your operating system gets a playback audio callback, that will just pull samples from that ring buffer. And I'm going to leave it at that, at that really simple high-level overview. I uploaded a YouTube video if you want to know uh, more about this on, on how some of the internals, how this works, and what, the, what considerations you need to take for buffering and latency. Uh, but I'm going to move on to the next topic now, where I talk about the ASRC and two really important considerations when you're using an ASRC to do audio synchronization. Consideration number one is, is fairly straightforward, right? This playback position n is going to be a floating point number, right? Because even though the input to that convert clock function might be an integer number of samples, there's no guarantee that that will match exactly a boundary of two samples in the target clock domain. It's, in general, going to be in between two samples. And so this num samples to write is also going to be a floating point number. And now, how does that make sense? You're asking an ASRC to produce 5.3 samples. Well, that, that can't really work. So we need to ask our ASRC how many, how many samples it actually produced. And now you might think, well, it's producing not, you know, we're, we're asking for these many of samples, but you're producing these many of samples. How is that going to work? Isn't that going to break synchronization? And it, it actually won't. And I'll show, the, I'll show you this by example. Let's just say the num samples to write was 1,020, uh, but the ASRC, and this is completely exaggerated, gave us 1,010 for some reason. That means this num samples written will be 10 samples too small. We, we would have liked it to be 10 samples larger than we would have been in sync exactly, but it turns out to be 10 samples too small. So the next time our audio callback is called, this is still 10 samples too small, obviously, and so as long as this playback position end has been calculated accurately, our num samples to write will now be 10 samples larger to compensate for that error we did in the last round. So this is a really nice thing about this basic algorithm, is that it always accounts for any errors that it did in the previous rounds, but always trying to catch up to the end of that buffer. That's why we're always synchronizing to the end of our audio buffer. And now comes the second consideration. This is much, much more subtle. Uh, so please bear with me. Now we have two audio interfaces. They're running, let's say, at a different rate. And we need an ASRC to generate these blue output samples. So you know, how, how could that be done? The ASRC might mix both of the two input samples. Um, but because the rate of the playback rate is different between, between both audio interfaces, that ratio of mixing changes with sample to sample. And now we come to this last sample, uh, and we get that last fifth blue sample. And now our, our call is done with the ASRC. But we can't throw away that last fifth sample, right? We only used 0.35 samples of that last input sample. So we need to buffer it somewhere. And that means the next time we call our callback and we call our ASRC again, it will already have 0.65 samples in its buffer to calculate the next sample. But this means that our ASRC has some kind of internal buffering going on, and that internal buffering is a fractional number. And even worse, that fraction will change, as we saw over time, right? As you're progressing through here, that weight was changing all the time. So the number of fractional samples our ASRC is buffering changes from call to call to call. And this was just a simple linear ASRC. If you would have a higher quality ASRC, you would have, I don't know, buffer sizes of, at Sing, we have something around 24 point something, right? It always changes. Uh, but you might have higher, higher buffering. And we need to account for that. We cannot ignore that, right? Because we're calculating the point in time where the current buffer should end, where the playback of the current buffer should end. That's not true anymore, because we now have, you know, conceptually, we have a delay line in front of our ASRC, which is delaying our samples. So we need to ask the ASRC, hey, how many input samples do you actually have buffered? And we need to take that into account when calculating the playback position end. And notice here that it's in the argument of the convert clock function. And that's correct, because this is all happening on the input side of the ASRC. And the input side of the ASRC is connected to the capture audio device. And so we need to do this in the clock domain of the capture audio device. Okay, some more details on this problem. If you don't care about subsample time sync, then you can ignore that, right? Because that fraction will always just be be between uh, two samples. 
Uh, the, the, the larger part, the 24 I said before, that's usually fixed with a higher um, accuracy ASRC, but that fractional part always changes. So if you don't care about that fractional part, fine, just ignore this. If you do care about this, then your ASRC needs to support some kind of get input samples buffered call. <coughs> and a very popular ASRC lib sample rate does not support it. So you could not use lib sample rate to do high accuracy um, audio synchronization. There's another very popular resampler called libzeta resampler, and it does support that. It's called input distance in the API. Uh, libzeta resampler is GPL. So for, for example, at Sing, I was searching for a high quality resampler that has that call, uh, but it has a commercial license and we couldn't find any, so, so we rolled our own. So just that you're aware, if you're a commercial company and want to do this kind of thing, you'll probably have to roll your own ASRC. Okay, now comes the largest section of the talk, and that's where I talk about this clock domains. So let's remind ourselves, we want to find the implementation for this magic function to convert between these representations of a single point in time from one clock domain to the other. And I'm going to introduce a new concept here called simultaneously captured timestamp pairs. What is that? Well, let's pretend we have two devices. They both have their independent clocks. They're both running at different rates and have different offsets. And then a simultaneously captured timestamp pair is just that, that at a single given moment in time, I capture the value of those two clocks. Right? And that's, a, that's a simultaneously captured timestamp pair. And if I plot that in a graph where the x-axis is the time in clock domain A and the y-axis is the time in clock domain B, it will give me a single point. I won't only have one of these uh, timestamp pairs, I'll, I'll have several of them. And remember, the goal is to find this clock convert function. And we don't only want to convert a time that's exactly at one of these dots here, right? We want to do it for any time in clock domain A. We want to convert it to clock domain B. So really, this is an interpolation problem, right? That pink line will be our clock convert function. And now you understand the subdivision a bit more. The algorithm bit is which algorithm are we using uh, to interpolate between these timestamp pairs? And then we have these simultaneously captured timestamp pairs themselves. Where do they actually come from? That's the second problem. So let's start with the algorithm side of things. Here, as an ansatz, we just use a linear function, alpha plus beta x where alpha and beta, they update each time a new timestamp pair comes in, we update that alpha and that beta. And that might seem very crude approximation, but it isn't because you have to really remember that that drift between audio interfaces is super slow. It's thermal drift, it's electrostatic noise, it's age of the crystals. And on the other hand, if you remember the basic algorithm, the timestamps that we are converting were only one buffer in the future. So, we don't need to probe timestamps that are far in the future, and the clock drift is really, really slow. So a linear ansatz is, is perfectly suitable for this problem. And now we just need to think about how do we actually update the alpha and the beta, and there are three algorithms to do this, linear regression, PID, and something called recursive least squares filters. Let's talk about linear regression. That's super straightforward. Imagine I just have two timestamp pairs. I'm just going to draw a line through them, and that's my alpha and my beta. Imagine now I would somehow know the exact clock convert function between two devices. That's that line in purple. I would perfectly know the clock convert function. Now, of course, my algorithm doesn't know about that. All it has are these timestamp pairs. Furthermore, it doesn't have all of them. They're coming in one by one. So in the beginning, I'll have that one blue dot down there. And I can't really do anything with that one blue dot. Um, so let's say another timestamp pair comes in, and now, hey, I've got two, I can, I can draw a line through it. And that's my current best approximation uh, for the clock convert function. And as I said a few slides early, we don't need to convert timestamps that are far in the future, just very, very close to that last timestamp pair. So that's that green line. And now, as we know the exact clock convert function in this toy example, we can calculate the error of our approximation, which, which is that, that orange line right there. And now, timestamp pairs will come in one by one, and we're always just going to connect the last two dots and, and see how we're doing. There we go. So we see that the 
our pink line is that approximation, and it's, it's pretty bad. Uh, the error is that, that orange line there. And if you sum up the error uh, of doing all of these, you'll get an error of 8.3%. So not, not super good. So how can we improve? Well, instead of just drawing a line through the last two dots, we're going to do a least squares linear regression through the last five uh, timestamp pairs. And now we see that the pink line uh, more closely approximate that purple line. And in fact, the, the error has halved. So you might be confident and say, hey, I'm just going to increase the number of, of timestamps I regress over even more. I'm going to increase it to 15. And indeed, at the start, you see the pink line hugging the purple line very, very closely. But as we get to the top of the curve, it's now too slow to react to any changes. And uh, the error goes up so that it's even outside of the graph. It's huge at the end there. And that's why the error, the overall error, actually, is, is the worst of all three. So let's look at some, some real data that we captured at Sing. Uh, this is not a, a curve. This is uh, many, many, many timestamp pairs zoomed out, thousands of timestamp pairs here in this plot. And you're looking at this and thinking, wait, what? this is just a diagonal, right? It's just the diagonal of, of that graph. And that's to be expected because both audio interfaces are running at the same nominal sample rate. So it's expected that at this zoomed out level, you'll just see a straight diagonal cutting through the middle of that graph. So we're going to subtract that to get a better view. And not much has changed, except if you look here, the scale has changed. And the reason why it's still a straight line is, again, as mentioned earlier, the highest contribution to clock drift is the static difference between the crystals. They're just cut differently, right, from in the factory. So we're going to measure that once and for all and then subtract it again, and that's exactly what I did. And now we see this dynamic um, drift um, between the two uh, audio interfaces. And if you look here, the scale is tiny, right? The drift is really, really small. Look how many seconds I did this uh, measurement and look at the drift. That's you know, one sample every 10,000 samples, a very, very tiny drift that you have in reality. Let's zoom in a bit more so that we can see the raw timestamp pairs. They look like this. And in hindsight, I can now go and say, hey, you know, looking at this data, I think the real clock uh, convert function was this purple line. And now let's see how a linear regression does for some real data. So I did a five-point linear regression, and it's super noisy, right? If we control an ASRC with this, uh, that, that would be really, really bad. So we increase the number of samples we regress over, and slowly but surely, it approaches um, the purple line, but just as before, if we increase it too much, it will be too slow in actually tracking um, the clock drift. And we can do this more systematically, of course. At Sing, we found um, that sort of for our use case, regressing over the last 200 uh, samples is, 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 gives us the least error. Now, there's some really big downsides of this a linear regression model, is that it has a sort of hard regression window, right? Either you're regressing over a timestamp pair or you're not. And even worse, older timestamp pairs are weighted just, as the, just the same as newer timestamp pairs. And that's a problem. Uh, for example, if you have outliers, um, this is what your clock convert approximation will look like. And you get these two delta peaks here, right? As that outlier enters the regression window, it all of a sudden jumps up. And as it exits the regression window, it jumps down again. So to avoid this, the only thing you can do is to filter the outliers. And I'm not going to go into this. This would be a whole top talk in and of itself on how to do correct outlier detection. It's super, super hard if you have noisy data and the data can change from application to application as it does in, 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 uh, at Sing. So uh, many hundreds of lines of code just to do outlier detection correctly. There's another more subtle issue. Uh, to do with noise, right? The linear regression will always sort of follow the noise of the input. It does so uh, inverse proportionally to the window width. So the more samples you regress over, the less the noise will be. But we just saw that there's sort of a maximum window width that you can tolerate because if you make it too big, your clock convert function will track drift too slowly. Uh, so you know a certain amount of noise will be unavoidable with a linear regression in your application. Sort of as a quick summary, at Sing we found that nevertheless, the linear regression gives us quite good prediction 
Uh, I find it's really easy to tune. You just have that one parameter, which is the history size and the number of samples to regress over. Cons is, and that's a big one, you need to consider outliers. So you need careful detection of edge cases that are other edge cases. Um, and one thing I didn't touch on is that it's computationally very expensive, right? You need to regress over the last 200 samples. Uh, that's not a simple task for a CPU to do. So let's look at some other algorithms, a PID. And I'm not going to talk about PID theory here. I'm just going to motivate my, why you might want to use a PID. Remember, we have this ansatz alpha plus beta x, and it kind of intuitively makes sense that this beta, and we'll see this later in the talk, that that beta somehow directly or indirectly controls the rate of the ASRC. And any time you have something controlling the rate of something and you want to minimize some kind of error by controlling that rate, you know, that screams PID, and that's exactly what we'll do here. Imagine a new uh, timestamp pair comes in, x, y, then the error is what would our prediction for that x, what would it, you know, what, what, would it, the, what would the prediction for the y have been if I would have not seen that new timestamp pair, right? I would have put the x into the clock convert function and predicted a y, and then I subtract the actual y that I got. That's, that's the error, and then I feed that error into a PID step, and the PID step will show me how I need to update the rate and the alpha. And if I do this for our data, uh, then a PID with 100 zero, zero gives me this, and a PID with coefficients of 100 zero, zero is a very special kind of PID in PID theory. That's a PID which instantly tries to undo any error that it got. And that's exactly what you see here. You see basically our interpolation just following the raw timestamp pairs. It's just following the dots. And that would be a very, very bad uh, interpolation to use. So what you typically do in that case is you decrease the p-factor, and then you start seeing these typical PID oscillations. So you need to increase the differential factor to, to dampen the oscillations, and then you play around with the parameters until you get something that you, that you like. So one really nice thing about the PID is it's, it's sort of a one-size-fits-all. Once you have... Uh, the, once you have your PID coefficients, it, it, it's, it's very adaptable to all sorts of noise, noise profiles, and it naturally deals with these edge cases. So these hundreds of lines of code I needed for edge case detection, you don't need it for a PID. It will, it will naturally adapt, and it's super computationally efficient. The downside is I find it difficult to tune. I'm, maybe I just need to learn more about PIDs, but you know, navigating that three-dimensional configuration space and trying to find a good set of parameters, uh, yeah, that was, that was challenging. And um, for us at Sing, it, it performs worse than, than using a linear regression. So I want to talk about the last algorithm, recursive lead squares filter. Now, I want to motivate this by looking at the disadvantages of the linear regression algorithm. And the two main downsides was that it was computationally expensive and that it had this box-like regression window. So instead of this box-like regression window, why don't we have an infinite history, but the weighting of older samples exponentially decays? This is great because noise patterns will be suppressed and we're also, we're also you know, weighting newer samples more than older samples. And anytime you hear something about like, you know, taking into account infinite number of samples, but the weight is decreasing, my DSP heart pounds and says, oh, that definitely sounds like a recursive filter. And indeed, you can find recursive filter coefficients uh, which approximate exactly that type of linear regression. And the theory is called recursive least squares filter. And I'm not going to go into detail because there's a Wiki article with exactly that name. And you can go look it up, and it shows you exactly how to do this. And it's a subset of Kalman filter theory. And this is what we use at Sing because it gives us the smallest error. Uh, that's that, that um, blue-green line there compared to the regular linear regression. But it's super computationally expensive. It's only uh, three recursive filters running in parallel. So pros and cons, it has all of the pros of the linear regression, but also it's very computationally efficient. The big con is you still need all of that code for outlier detection because you still have that sharp edge um, on the one side. So as a summary, um, I think PID is your best friend if you need uh, simple 
you know, good quality time sync and you don't want to look at all the different types of outliers that you might have, it should work with a broad set of noise, uh, then, then use a PID. If you need the absolute best precision in time sync, I'll use a linear regression or a least squares filter, and the least squares filter is, is more computationally efficient than, than the linear regression. There's a bunch of detail I, I glossed over, which I just don't have the time. There's so much more to this topic, and, and if you're going to implement this yourself, you really need to look at some of these details, uh, but I, I just don't have the time to do that in, the, in this talk. Okay, let's get to the second part. Where do these simultaneous timestamp pairs actually come from? Just to remind ourselves, let's say we have two audio interfaces and we want to convert uh, timestamps from one clock domain to the other. They both have a free running clock. They're running at different rates. We want to basically get a capture of these two clocks at exactly the same point in time. And the more simultaneously we can do that, we will see uh, the more accurate our synchronization algorithm will be. So one way to do this is, we have our two audio callbacks of our two devices, and in them I'm just counting the number of samples that have elapsed. And again, that's a clock, right? We showed that at the beginning. So that's, that's a timestamp pair right there. It's, it's not very good because it's going to be, the resolution of those are, 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 you know, are going to be linked to your buffer size. They're only going to increment in, in buffer sizes. So your time sync error is proportional to the audio buffer size meaning you need a large history in your clock domain converter. And if I run this on a Raspberry Pi, the sort of sync accuracy you can get is around between 20 and 30 milliseconds. But a really cool thing about this algorithm is, is that nowhere did I specify, actually, that those audio interfaces need to be connected to the same laptop. And indeed, the capture device could be connected to the internet somehow and sending samples that it's captured over the internet to my laptop. And instead of looking how many samples I've captured over time, I'm just going to look at the number of samples I've received because that's a really good approximation to the number of samples that device has captured. So if I look at it from the perspective of my laptop here, I can just replace that audio callback with a network callback and just count the number of audio samples I've received of the network, and that's a good timestamp pair. It's a very, very crude synchronization, but it definitely works. You know, the synchronization you can sort of expect is 500, 400 milliseconds in, in jitter, right? There's going to be some constant delay, which is your, your, your network delay that you just have over the internet, which could be several seconds. But on top of that, the synchronization will jitter with something around 400 milliseconds. So, um, but it works, and, and I mean, it's used. Okay, now I want to take a tiny break, uh, a tiny, tiny sidestep, because at the beginning, I said that once we have implementations for these magic functions, a nice thing about this basic synchronization algorithm is that it will take on different forms. And this is exactly what we're going to do here now, because now we have a concrete implementation um, of some of these magic functions. So let's look at this again. We have our two audio callbacks, but now the first audio callback should be a capture device, and the second audio callback Sorry, the first audio callback should be a playback device. The second audio callback should be a capture device. And, and notice here that I'm renaming that variable now because it's a capture device to capture position. And furthermore, I'm assuming uh, that the playback device is tracking the capture device. Um, so that means that in the playback device's callback, uh, I can just read samples out of that FIFO, that FIFO that's being fed by that magic write samples function. And all of the magic is actually happening in the capture device callback. So let's look at that. First of all, what we do is we have our timestamp pairs that we've gotten from, from these callbacks, and we just need to process them, right? The clock converter needs to update the alpha and the beta. And then we update the, uh, the timestamp, the capture timestamp itself, and then we just have the basic algorithm. This is a copy and paste uh, from one of the first slides I showed at the beginning of the talk. And now we know the implementations of some of these magic functions. Let's assume a PID here. How does a PID update alpha and beta given a timestamp pair? It does it like this. And then how do we do the clock conversion? It's just a linear function. And now I'm going to refer you to another YouTube video because this is quite lengthy. I'm going to move stuff around and then I'm going to cancel a bunch of stuff, but it's totally boring. But if you still want to see it, um, scan that. What happens at the end when you do all of this moving around and canceling um, you get something that looks like this. That PID here, 
it's now being controlled by the fill level of the ring buffer of that FIFO, right? So that FIFO that's being controlled by this read samples and write samples magic function. And in turn, the PID is directly controlling the rate of our ASRC, right? It's just updating the beta, and the beta is directly controlling the rate of the ASR ASRC. And that totally makes sense intuitively, right? If our fill level in our ring buffer is starting to deplete and it's you know, getting close to zero and we're about to underrun, well, then it makes sense to reduce our playback speed. And if it's filling up and filling up and filling up and almost overflowing, then, well, then we should you know, increase our playback speed and increase the beta. And just notice here that there's no more alpha here anymore. So that alpha in many concrete implementations just vanishes. That algorithm that you're seeing here, it's a very commonly used algorithm. You see it everywhere. It's a it's super easy algorithm for crude time synchronization, especially if you're synchronizing over the network. You see that all over the place. Really important to point out, and I point this out in the video. I'm not showing it here, but that simplification that I did, that only works in certain situations. Okay, bracket closed. Let's get back to the main part of the talk. We're talking about timestamp pairs, and we were looking at this a clock domain conversion on how to convert between two audio interfaces, and it wasn't very satisfying, right? We only had 25 milliseconds of synchronization accuracy, so can we do better? And yes, we can if we replace that clock domain conversion with two clock domain conversions. So now we have our two audio callbacks again, but we have two clock domain converters, and the timestamp pair now is um, the number of frames that have been played and the system ticks that have gone by, right? Uh, when we get an audio callback, we immediately grab a copy of the system ticks, and we know that when we get an audio callback, that was the point in time when we've played these number of samples, so that makes a really good timestamp pair. And now to convert between one interface's clock domain and the other interface's clock domain, I just need to cascade those two clock domain conversions, and we get much better synchronization, much, much better synchronization, right? Um, 300 microseconds. And it doesn't depend on the buffer size anymore. What it depends on is how quickly you can get that get system ticks, how quickly you can get that. And you know, if your operating system is busy processing other interrupts, your audio callback might be called late, and you might get a copy of the system ticks too late. Luckily, operating system vendors know exactly about this problem. And so they have an API in every major operating system. There's an API to get exactly that timestamp pair, that tick audio interface's timestamp pair. Apple has it, Windows has it, Android, Linux has it. And it's really nice to use this API because it will not only take that timestamp pair in the kernel to give you the best accuracy. If your hardware and driver supports it, it will do it in the hardware. It will take that timestamp pair in the hardware. And as a rule of thumb, um, built-in audio in laptops and, and desktop computers, they support this hardware timestamp capture. And for example, Intel devices, Intel claims it's uh, 42 nanosecond accurate. It's hard for me to measure that accurately, but I definitely know it's under 100 nanoseconds if I do the measurements myself. But this depends on the audio interface hardware. If you're using USB audio, there it also depends on the operating system. On Mac, you get something around 125 microseconds, which is the size of a USB microframe. Okay, now back to this uh, uh, synchronization where we're synchronizing two audio interfaces over the network. We already showed how we can do this in a very crude way, but again, we're going to do the same trick. Instead of doing this direct clock domain conversion, we're going to do three, actually. Uh, we already talked, we just talked about this clock domain conversion from the audio interface to the tick clock domain. So let's talk about this clock domain conversion, how we can convert clocks from two tick clock domains of two separate computers that are connected via a network link. And let's assume that that network link has no propagation delay whatsoever, that the moment in time you put a network packet on that network link, it somewhat magically appears on the other side instantaneously. Well, then there's a really naive algorithm you can do. You can take a snapshot of your own clock, you instantly put it on the wire, it instantly appears on the other side. The pink computer, in that moment, takes a snapshot of its own clock, and now you have a timestamp pair. Now let's assume that that network link is, does have a propagation delay. Um, well, we can do the same thing in reverse, right? Now the green computer has a timestamp pair. 
And it turns out that with these four timestamp pairs, you can estimate the network link propagation delay. But a key point is you can only do that if the path delay remains constant over time, and strictly constant over time. So that means if you have two computers connected like this via a network switch, that path delay is certainly not going to be constant because your switch might be routing other traffic, so it's going to put your, you know, it's going to buffer your network packet, and then once it has time to do so, it will actually schedule your packet to be sent. Um, so yeah, the network path delay between the blue and the pink computer is not constant. But what is constant is the network path delay on each of these blue lines here, right? Because that's just, that's just an Ethernet cable. So all of these blue lines have constant um, network path delay. So what you could do in theory is you could uh, convert between clocks at each step of the way like this. But that's a really bad idea, because that doesn't scale very well, right? Imagine a large network, you would have to convert all of these clocks. Not only that, it somehow requires you to know the topology of the network. You would need to know exactly where your switches are, and switches of different vendors would need to be able to talk to each other to exchange timestamp information, uh, and that's, that's not possible. So we need some kind of standardized way for switches, etc., to exchange timestamp information, and there is such a protocol that's called Precision Time Protocol. It's an IEEE protocol, and it not only standardizes the network packet format to exchange timestamp information, it also mandates something called a PTP clock, which is a free-running hardware clock on every, in every, uh, for every PTP network participant. So the switches, your computer, all have a free-running PTP clock inside of the network interface chip. And there's two important things about this PTP clock. Number one is the timestamp information we're sending around in these network packets, that's no longer the number of ticks. It's the value of that PTP clock that we're sending around the network now. And number two, and that's more important, we can control the rate of that PTP clock in software and the offset. So we can, we can say, hey, PTP clock, run a bit faster. The PTP clock is running in hardware, but we can, we can control that clock. And then the algorithm is as follows, sort of, instead of calculating the alpha and the beta um, from these timestamp packets, what we actually do is we, we change the speed of our clock so that all of these clocks slowly match up. And now, all of these PTP hardware clocks are showing the exact same time value. And that's very, very convenient because now we have a single clock domain, and that's called the PTP clock domain because all of these PTP clocks are showing the same value. And then we just have to do one clock domain conversion from the tick clock domain of our computer into the clock domain of that PTP clock. So that's only scratching the surface, believe me, of what PTP can do. PTP is, is insane. It's, like a, it's a whole package of standards. Uh, it's, it's, it's huge. And this strict form of PTP I was showing you here, where the PTP clock is running in hardware, um, that only works in professional grade network switches or switches specifically built for audio video synchronization like AVB compatible switches. And it doesn't support Wi-Fi. But you can run uh, non-strict PTP where the clock is not in hardware but the, it's a virtual clock basically in software. Um, and then PTP does support traditional Wi-Fi and does support traditional network switches. Uh, and um, that's Im implemented in all major uh, operating systems. Uh, PTP is used by, was widely successful, it's used by AVB, by Apple AirPlay, it's used by Dante. Um, the AVB version requires the strict hardware implementation of the PTP clocks and all of the others. They will use the better accuracy of the hardware clocks if you have the hardware, but they will just fall back to the software clocks um, if you don't have the hardware. And if you look at some of these measurements here, uh, PTP is, is really incredible. Uh, I have two laptops connected to a PTP compliant switch at home, and the synchronization accuracy is 10, 10 nanoseconds, usually under 10 nanoseconds. If I use sort of the software variant, I use you know, a USB Ethernet dongle and a traditional switch. This, this is highly dependent on your Ethernet dongle, by the way. You get something around 300 microseconds. And in Wi-Fi, it fails admissibly. You get 10 milliseconds. And why is that? 
Well, that's because it turns out that in modern Wi-Fi chipsets, the network packets are scheduled in hardware. And when I mean hardware, I don't mean firmware. I actually mean in hardware, there's a state machine scheduling when your packets go out, uh, out over the air. And that means timestamping these network packets is, is near, nearly impossible. But we can use something else, and that's uh, something called a TSF counter. And so the Wi-Fi spec mandates that every Wi-Fi participant in its Wi-Fi chipset has a TSF counter, which has one microsecond resolution. It's TSF stands for time synchronization function. The Wi-Fi standard also mandates that the access point sends out regular beacons every 102.4 milliseconds and has a copy of the TSF counter at the exact moment it sent out that beacon. And now, all of the stations, all of the Wi-Fi stations, can synchronize their TSF clocks to the TSF clock of the access point. This is very similar to PTP, uh, but not quite the same. And that's because the TSF uh, counter in each of these stations, it's a free-running clock. That means it's proportional to some crystal inside the Wi-Fi chipset. And the TSF clocks, they will slowly drift apart over time. And then a new beacon comes in, and they're synced up again. And then they slowly drift apart over time, and then they sync up again. So PTP, we could control the rate. We could exactly control the rate to match. Here, we can't do that. They're always drifting apart, and then they synchronize again every time a beacon comes in. Now, this is a really great way to synchronize audio. Unfortunately, no operating system has a standardized API to get the TSF. Uh, and there's, let alone to somehow get a timestamp pair in the kernel or even in hardware. So if you want to rely on this type of synchronization, you're going to need your Wi-Fi chipset vendor uh, to support you. And just a brief overview of what we do at Sing. Every time a beacon comes in, our Wi-Fi chipset will toggle a little GPIO pin. And the GPIO pin is directly connected to our SOC, and it's connected to a peripheral in, peripheral in our SOC, which in hardware takes a copy of the CPU's tick counter, but it also fires an interrupt. And then in software, we ask the Wi-Fi chip, hey, what was the last TSF value in your beacon? And now we have a hardware to hardware end um, timestamp pair capturing, and that allows us to have a time sync uh, uh, below one microsecond. OK, that concludes the timestamp pair section of my talk. This is the last slide of my talk. This is a quick clock domain overview of the clock domains we have at Sing. I already mentioned the Wi-Fi clock domain. Um, and then if we look at a single cell, we do all of our audio processing in that Wi-Fi clock domain. And that's super, super useful because, I don't know, let's say 100 samples uh, of processing audio, those 100 samples will have the same playback duration on any one of those speakers because they're all in the same Wi-Fi clock domain. That makes it super simple to schedule audio. We just say, oh, play this audio uh, thumbnail at sample offset 5003. And then they all play it at exactly the same time. We then need to ASRC to the codec clock domain where we do further DSP. And then we send it to the audio codec. And the ASRC is controlled uh, by clock domain converters, which are two clock domain converters cascaded together, one clock domain converter from the Wi-Fi clock domain to the tick clock domain, which I just showed you, where the timestamps are all taken in hardware. And then we have another clock domain converter from the tick clock domain to the codec clock domain, which is done with these operating system level APIs. And it turns out in our hardware, that's also done in hardware. And that allows us to have an overall audio synchronization of under five microseconds. So in summary, this talk, a long, 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 long talk. There are two main takeaways I want you to take away from this talk. First of all, that basic audio synchronization algorithm, it's a super general form. And it's very, very convenient because it allows you to, to break up the problem into several sub-problems by using these magic functions to abstract away some of the, the difficult parts. And number two, Second takeaway is if you just want low accuracy time sync, use a PID, use that buffer fill level algorithm I showed you. Really, really simple. If you want high accuracy audio synchronization, I hope you're convinced after 50 minutes of me babbling, it's super hard. The devil is in the details. You're probably going to need some support by your hardware. Thank you. Uh, how do you measure, properly measure the sub, uh, sub sample latency? difference between different points? Um, so so um, 
I mean, the timestamp, I mean, it, 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 it all depends on these timestamp pairs, right? Um, these timestamp pairs, the operating system will tell you, it, it's, always, it's always a floating point number. The operating system will tell you um, the number of ticks of my CPU was this value, and the number of samples that have elapsed on the playback device was 5.434. Um, so the operating system is not giving you that timestamp pair in full number of samples. It's giving it to you. Uh, super accurately, right? So for Intel, for example, 42 nanoseconds. And then additionally, you're averaging over many timestamp pairs. That, even, that improves the accuracy even more because you're getting rid of some of the noise and some of the error that you're seeing. Yep, check. Thanks.